welcome to Uncover Podcasts, where the Canberra and wider community can hear members of the University of Canberra tackle a range of subjects and issues. Uncover is the University of Canberra's new online platform for sharing our stories with our community, the nation and the world to illustrate the real world effect of our contributions. In this special In Conversation episode, you'll hear from Charles Landry, an international urban change leader who recently toured Canberra to talk all things ambition and more specifically, how Canberra can punch above its weight. Join the University of Canberra's Associate Dean of Architecture, Erin Hinton, and Associate Professor in Architecture, Max Maxwell, as they deep dive into Charles's concept of the creative city. Erin is an architect, urban researcher, and educator who has extensive research and design experience across a range of project types. And Max is an educator, design researcher, and registered architect whose research looks at the overlap of architecture and technology. Here's Erin Max and Charles Land. So hello Charles Landry, I'd like to welcome you to the University of Canberra Uncover podcast this morning. I hope you'll allow me the pleasure of a brief introduction Charles. In addition to being a widely acclaimed speaker and author, you are an international authority on the use of imagination and creativity in urban change projects. You work with cities around the world to help them make the most of their potential, to make more of their resources and assets and do better than expected. In short, to become cities of ambition. And we are fortunate to have you here in Canberra on your City of Ambition tour to explore ways in which Canberra can punch above its weight, how Canberra may become a city of ambition. So Charles, I have an icebreaker for you. I believe you've been in Canberra for a whole 12 hours or so this visit and in 2014 before that, of course. So I wanted to ask you, what are your at-a-glance impressions of our city? Well, part of those 12 hours I was sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) I would hope so. (laughs) Um, No, it it was quite interesting. I mean, it it looked a bit sort of sharper as I came in and we went into Civic and had a meal in the evening and it was a Tuesday night and the restaurant was incredibly full and I thought, oh Christ, hey, what's happening here? Because historically I I felt, you know, Civic was a bit dead on a Tuesday. Um, So that was one uh, impression. Uh, Clearly there have been new buildings, the tram and all of that. That's all new. And so so that's actually quite a dramatic change. And I presume that sort of foreshortens the distance between these other places that are outlying. Um, so, So those are two major things I noticed in that short period. I think there's a bit more fizz. But I'm not sure. Yeah. I've got to find out tonight. <laughs> and so you see the tram as a positive contribution to the city? Yeah, inevitably, because, I mean, ultimately what you want, I suppose, and, and of, co- of course I'm European, so I've sort of got a bit of that in my mindset, but, but you want sort of seamless connectivity that you don't have to actually get into a car. I mean, it could be quite relaxing if you just get somewhere and then whatever, read, look at something on the way. So, so I think all sorts of other types of mobility, micro-mobility and all of that is all good stuff. It's just, I mean, as you well know, cars are only used about something like 8% of the time and they take up a hell of a lot of space. I'm not sure how much space they take up in Canberra, but many cities, cars and the road takes up more than 50%. So you've got all this other area, what could you do with it? Um, So anyway, trams I think are a positive contribution. Okay, so I actually, I'm going to return to the subject of Canberra a little bit later on, Charles, but before that, I wanted to move quite quickly, I guess, to a concept that I know will be of great interest and, of course, relevance to Canberra, and that's your concept of the creative city, but more pointedly, civic creativity, which I know you're kind of moving into. So you've written and spoken incredibly eloquently since the late 1980s of the creative city, but I did want for you to explain, particularly for the benefit of our audience, um, what is the creative city? And perhaps more importantly, how does civic creativity contribute to creative city making? It's a great question. Uh, The one sentence summary of a sort of originally a 300 page book I now try to make it all shorter, uh, is in a period of dramatic transformation, how do you create the conditions for people to think, plan and act with imagination in creating opportunities and solving problems? That's essentially what the creative city is about. 
And that requires a sort of mindset that is quite alert, flexible, agile, all of, awake, uh, all of these types of words. And what that then does, I believe, if you have those conditions, which is obviously about openness, then you see more potential because at least you're not saying, no, 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 no. Uh, you're letting someone, anyone, at least have an idea to start with. And that's better than having no idea. So in very crude terms, that's the creative city. Um, obviously, its expression is in many ways, you know, it can be obviously activity in the day and the evening and all of that. But a lot of what it's about, if you're looking at the atmosphere of a creative place, is the possibility to have chance encounter, serendipity, all of these things, so that you feel as an individual, you've got choices, opportunities, things happening and so on. Added to which, obviously, a creative place occasionally has something that's inspirational. Uh, but a lot of what actually makes a creative city is lots of small things together that are orchestrated rather than, boom, boom, you know, the monumental. And that's obviously the Canberra issue to some extent. How do you blend the monumental with that finer texture? So coming to civic creativity, a city obviously has a vast number of things to do. And the civic basically is saying there is something about the general interest, the public interest, the common good, all of these sorts of words. And civic, to me, not civic in the sense of your civic there, is, is about all of that. How do we live together in relative balance and, and, and harmony? And the public domain, the public sector to some extent, is partly, well, is a main actor in that, but obviously in collaboration with the other interests. Now, for 20, 30 years, the idea of the public domain, the public, you know, Margaret Thatcher said, there's no society, everybody in a bureaucracy is rubbish and so on. Uh, that's why for the last time I'm using the word creative, I developed this whole notion of the creative bureaucracy, which is basically saying to the bureaucrat, look, not all of you are stupid. So, you know, many of you are very well educated, but there's something that happens in the institutions, which is quite rigid and quite too structured. So what you get is particularly in a world where we need new ways of operating social media and all of that, that inner life needs to change to give people more possibility to flourish. Um, so the civic is partly some of the entrepreneurial um, actions that you would associate with the private sector or NGOs applied to those public institutions. And that requires a transformation to how they operate because they want sort of certainty step by step and so on. But the world isn't quite like that. You know, often it's more about creating, uh, what would you call it, uh, move from a no because culture to a yes if culture. So some of the qualities of the public but with those things about transparency and equality you, you associate with the public interest. Sorry, that was rather a long answer, Erin. No, no. I do. I had a question off that, actually. So you mentioned, yes, of course, Canberra has been defined as the city of monuments, as one mm. of our many definitions that we mm. seem to. Mm. But I, I, I'm quite interested in that point you made about um, – uh, I guess, the collection of small things that make up a city and you use the word orchestra. So I guess ideally who would be the conductor of this orchestra of small things? Lovely question. The orchestra, oh my God, that's a lovely question. Um, that I think is a number of people actually because that's when self-organisation happens because you want, you, you want to create an atmosphere fear where things are possible but I don't think there's sort of one leader, you know, the person from the top doing that. Clearly leadership has changed over time and it's hopefully less dictatorial, but it's more an enabling leadership to allow experiments. Some of the things fail. And when we say experiments, it could be a trivial thing. Hey, I want to start a restaurant. I've always wanted to start a restaurant. And then you start and you think, Christ, the last thing I want to do is go to bed at 2.30 at night, having cleaned up or whatever. Uh, so it can be that level to the bigger experiment, just looking at things differently. So the orchestra, it's there's an element of trust. You know, it's more organic. You, 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 obviously, you have principles that guide it, 
Uh, but a great place, I think, has many leaders and many conductors. So they is, connect. So is jazz perhaps a better analogy than an orchestra in that instance? Absolutely. I often say, I mean, absolutely jazz. It's, it's, it's not like a symphony orchestra. It's more like a jazz trio. Funnily enough, you say that. That's one of the key sentences in the latest thing. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. On we go. Well, I wanted to speak maybe about some of the more recent work that you've been working on and, and I guess the concept of the nomad. Oh, yeah. Um, and I guess perhaps it does tie into, well, like inevitably it does tie into, I guess, the previous conversation. But um, Canberra, of course, in itself as a, a city designed around governance has a long tradition of the nomad in the sense that people have come from all over. Yeah. For, for periods of time uh, in the seats of representation. Um, but also, I guess, in concert to that, this idea of the city being deinstitutionalized through the enabling of other industries of the private sector, of the creative sector to thrive and prosper as well. So in that sense, I guess, cities are now competing for intellectual capital. Uh, I wondered if you might, um, just for our listeners, perhaps begin by contextualizing your position or your most recent work on um, the nomadic city. Yeah, I mean, but basically the one sentence summary, shorter sentence this time, of that book is uh, where do I belong when everything is on the move or where do we belong when everything is on the move? You know, when everything is shifting, where is where am I feeling anchored? And what that's really in summary trying to say is that I think people want, apart from, you know, having some basic income and stuff like that, a number of things. They want anchorage on the one hand, some sense of stability, perhaps history around them. But they want also the opposite, the sort of sense of opportunity, can do, action and so on. And they want to be connected and they want to obviously make the best of themselves and occasionally be inspired. So if that's the sort of backdrop that people want these two things that seemingly push in different directions, and there's a world which enables you to be here and there simultaneously, and there's the sort of anywhere, any place, any time phenomenon. That's a different experience of space, place, and time. And the Nomadic City book is really about thinking through that because when you just look at all the people, if you ask anyone, uh, most people, you will find they've lived in many places um, and they have many identities. They have many different sort of relationships. So what I'm just trying to explore is how, where do we feel sort of at ease? Are we at ease just in continual movement or do we need to be anchored in a, in a, in a place? And this nomadic thing, when you just think of the numbers, if you just take, you know, there are 80 million refugees, there are 10 million uh, stateless people, there are millions, I've forgotten the number of people who are expats working somewhere else in the Middle East, half the people are, 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 are expats, uh, there are long distance commuters, there are people who are working away from home, all of that thing. And what you're getting is literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who are continually uh, 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 moving. So my main interest is where do I find uh, my sense of self, that place where I feel, I mean, this all sounds a bit pompous, but, you know, where I can find meaning in life or something. And so I'm just trying to explore that. And obviously digitization enables all of that. And as you well know, the, the digital and you know, smartphones and so on, they're, they're addictive. Sorry, they're known to be addictive because they you know, increase your dopamine and it has similar th that swiping, all, all of that. We, we know that. And all of that has these immense opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, it fragments. So I'm probably just reflecting on my own life. Actually, everything I do is just reflecting on myself <laughs> and pretending it's of general interest. But, um, but that, that's the dilemma I'm interested in. So, I, and you, you touched on it when you said that word or that term fracture, but if we're not to acknowledge that there is this shift, this kind of flow, and we're not planning for that, what is this idea of the nomadic doing to our cities? Well, what that means in terms of place, um, I'll give two examples, two extreme examples, but one obviously is places are probably slightly more flexible 
in terms of, of, of use, I think. And in terms of thinking about buildings and things like that, you, you, you conceive of them, I think, in a way of multiple possibilities within them. Because also, I think we're in a world where people want to express themselves a lot. It's not all, I'm going to an event and you are performing for me, or, or of course that's still happening. But people are much more, I feel, wanting to be makers, shapers, co-creators of their own environment and place. So that means that I think a lot of people, of course not everyone, uh, you know, you don't want the pre-digested. I mean, a person who's in this nomadic world has lots of opportunities to see things. They can see it through the internet and so all sorts of options and choices. So that's one thing in terms of the phys physical. I think it's slightly more permeable, flexible, the distinction between the private the semi-public and the openly public is different. It means, obviously, third space. The third space logic is an absolute driver um, because, you know, where would I want to work? Of course, actually, at an office. Do I really want to work in an office? Actually, would I prefer? I mean, I quite, like many people, I like being in an environment where other people are doing things and I can't really hear what they're saying or anything. But... I find I can concentrate better in third spaces. Now, that is changing the way many entities look and feel. Uh, I mean, for example, the main bank in Berlin of the Deutsche Bank, you go in there, I mean, you know it's the Deutsche Bank because it's got that sign, and you're thinking, is this a meditation centre? What's going on here? Obviously, you can have some coffee and stuff like that, and there's an incubation centre garden there and then somewhere in the background where you are over there even further away is a banking facility yeah or in Antwerp the main bank there the facilities are on the fifth floor and it's a bit like you four sitting there probably doing a startup so that's a bank having transformed if you look at uh, some new educational entities, they look more like interior design shops or something like that. So if you look at every type of facility, uh, it, it, it's changing. To pick the time thing, so that was just one thing, how does place transform? There's an interesting cafe which started in Moscow called Zifferblatt where there's a chess clock here on the table, there's coffee and croissant or whatever it is. That's all free. The only thing that counts is the time. So you come in there and say, all right, Erin, that was two hours. I don't know what that is, $3 or something. So all of these things are changing. But because that movement, that continual movement, you know, I'm moving here as I'm talking, it's a bit like a dance, uh, there is this issue of stability, which is why I'm not surprised that people talk about mindfulness. Of course, it should be called mind emptiness. But <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, uh, so I guess at one level what we're talking about is how a contemporary city can offer an authentic experience for, I guess, the, the, the influx of people that are particularly not from that place. So how can one identify with that city if you don't identify with the historical trajectory of that place? Um, so I guess my, my question then is, is, is that perhaps some of the examples of City Now, I guess, it, on the one hand, is it idea of participation? Is that the, the key instrument through which people can build authentic relationships to space and time, as you suggest? Or on the other hand, I guess if one was being a little bit more cynical, there's sort of a certain capitalization of public space right now as well. And, you know, the example of to sit and dwell in the city, one needs to now sit and dwell within a cafe. So there's a kind of transaction to that, which I guess on the one hand is sort of uh, a counterpoint to the notion of an authentic public experience. Well, there are three or four questions in that question, I think. Um, where to begin? I mean, quite clearly, the way the world's worked, things are a money transaction too much. And in a sense, that's again back to the public, something that is free where it's not de demanding anything from me. More places and spaces like that are, are obviously key, which is why shopping centres ultimately are a, they're okay, but, you know, they're, they're not the most enriching experience uh, in the world. 
So that's one thing. The other thing that you were highlighting is this outsider coming into a place, and that's often obviously a conflict, the outsider insider. But there are things that sometimes the, the, the outsider insider often wants certain things together, it's things that we might call, I don't know, livability, quality of life type things. And there are alignments between them, so they don't need to be co contradictory. Uh, and that that's where it depends on the size of the place. If you're in Amsterdam, Berlin, and so on, where the influx of the outsider, I mean, the nomadic is also these millions of tourists, tourists, international tourism has grown by 130 times in the last 50 years. So if you just imagine that. Uh, so in places like that, which are vortex cities, of which there are some, I suppose Sydney is a bit of a vortex, Melbourne is, Adelaide is less of a vortex. Uh, that's when you really get that clash between the, 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 the local and the external person, and particularly in Europe where then someone in Berlin, I'm just using that because I've been living there for a bit, uh, you know, can't say a word of German and everybody has to speak English, so they of course get a bit you know, uh, uh, angry and so on. So, but then you've also used a word which is an incredibly difficult word, which is authentic. You know, what is authentic is not easy to answer. Um, certainly not at whatever time it is this morning. Um, uh, but I think what we mean by authentic is back to that word I was saying, things, the transactional thing, rather than the relational thing, because I think what you're the, really talking about when you say everything is a transaction, is a, is a money thing, what one really is trying to create settings where you can have a relationship. So, so that, that's, that's one big thing. Um, I'm beginning to lose my thread because this authentic is so difficult that it's sort of <laughs> weighing down on me. But I think I'm going back to the word of pre-digested, uh, that, 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 that you're trying to get a situation and a conversation with people where you just feel that the person and the environment's creating it, where you really feel this is just you, this is just Max, this is just Erin, rather than Erin filtered through all sorts of imagery and stuff like that. And I think that's when you get, and I used the word meaning before, you say, oh, that was a meaningful conversation. That was a meaningful encounter. This is a meaningful place. Where it becomes difficult, because I can imagine the meaningful conversation, if we just really relaxed, mm. we would have an even more meaningful conversation. I'm then trying to translate that into what is the physical environment that reflects that. And that's when you again get the disnification of places, the branding, overbranding, overstimulation, thinking in advance for you, where you really feel you're being controlled, added to which every time you click something on the internet, Google knows what you're doing and where you are. So, yeah, that's why you probably know about the whole movement about my data, which is try people trying to abstract away from that in order, again, I'm back to this point about anchoring. So this authentic thing is it's blasted a treat, it? us. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good question. But I do, yeah, I definitely. No, I think it was yeah. facetious <laughs> in many ways. But I do, yeah, I do think you're right. In it. Yeah, I mean, I think the drive and one of the issues I think you're – hinting at is that whole thing about representative versus uh, participative democracy. I mean, it's, I don't think it's the same. That is a big thing that's happening quite clearly, but there are a lot of countries where it's precisely not happening. And these conversations were happening in the whole parts of the world. You couldn't really even have this conversation. But I think <coughs> people want to be more engaged. They don't want to be having sort of be the victim of circumstances also. They want to take a bit more control. And I think what can happen is you just feel overwhelmed by other forces. If you look at some of the negative things that have happened, populism, Brexit, and all of these things, it's partly because people feel they're lost. They're lost in a miasmic swamp of things that are happening to them, although they're partly addicted 
to some of the issues like like obviously they want the, the, the delights of mobile phones and so on. So I think we are in actually a quite a difficult world. I mean, obviously the creative city idea in general is more glass half full than glass half empty. So even though I feel the world is turning to its darker face and it can really feel, oh, I can't take it, I just don't want to be in that position. And I want to say there is a way of having alternatives. And I think we're in a situation, just to get a bit more political, uh, just my local CAF where I live in an incredibly alternative place in Britain next to a place that's like Tuscany, so it's got this <laughs> funny mix, is where Extinction Rebellion w was founded in the local cafe, yeah? Uh, now, you then really realise, you know, at some point this other stuff, are we really taking the environment seriously? Yeah, you, you talk about it all the time, everything is sustainable, but what are you actually doing? And therefore there will be more of these reactions and in a sense, you completely understand them. Um, I mean, overheard in my local place when I was just at the station getting on the train and this young woman, she, how old was she, 17 max, she said, oh, did you manage to get arrested? Oh, and the other one saying, you, you, know, you know what I mean, because... Uh, uh, so there'll be more and more of that because of these frustrations that are boiling up. Yeah, we, I did, we did want to actually kind of talk about those frustrations because... It's not being cynical. I think it's just being frank. But often when we come together into community forums to talk about city development, the future of our cities, those kind of conversations, you end up with this duality, and I'm generalising here, but there's those that are resistant to adjustment and then there's those that are wanting to engage with it but not knowing how. And so I wanted to talk about, I guess, what kind of scale of adjustment are we talking about that we're, you know, we're acquiring in our cities? And for those people who are particularly resistant to that, how can we kind of encourage investment in those changes? This is a really difficult issue because there's, at a general level, there's a psychological problem that to some extent, even I, you know, there's an element of psychological denial about what is actually happening and then actually having to face it, which is quite an, uh, which is a massive adjustment. I presume the older you get in general, and not every old person is inflexible, but nevertheless, um, there, 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 there is this pro problem about change. And um, I think that's when some of the evidence, unfortunately, you have to bring some of the evidence uh, through. You know, what is the cost of the thing that is comfortable to you in real terms if there is a bigger calculus out there? which is not just your own private interest. And there was a lovely exhibition last time I was here, and I will show this photo, which was in Canberra. It was called Beyond the Self. I don't know what it was about, but just Beyond the Self. It, to me, it was the we world rather than the me world. And I think if one – I mean, I'll just give you a stupid example. There are 260 million cars in Europe. In those cars is – 440 tonnes of gold, they're all scrapped. I mean, it's in the circuitry and all of that. It's going to cost a lot of money to get it out. There's something like 3,000 tonnes of silver and so on. So I'm just trying to say there's a completely different potential economy out there. We call it circular economy. You can give it whatever words. But when you really get drilled down, it all means we have to slightly behave differently. And in the context of a Canberra, perhaps, you know, some of these roads just getting into the campus here. I just looked at one of them. I thought about nine lanes. I was thinking, do we really need nine? Could, wouldn't five do? Um, no criticism. Um, but, you know, there, there's probably a bit of a tightening up and you immediately saw, you know, when we're looking at the bikes going past, uh, it seemed to be because there was a bike lane and when there isn't. So our behaviours can, can can change and they do, they do change. I mean, the speed at which people don't use plastic now, suddenly, bang. And I think a few things are going to happen like that. And then people, of course, say, oh, you're just being politically correct or, 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 or whatever else. But I think that if we have different, uh, what do you call it, Qu not quantities, what do you call it, measures of what's going on and and throw out these iconic messages like the 400 tonnes of gold, people sort of 
oh, there is something here. Oh, and gold is apparently running out in 22 years. Somehow there's a relationship. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so I think that psychological thing in terms of cities is interesting for me. I wrote a little book with a friend of mine called Psychology and the City, where we, tr we were trying to say, look, there's a lot of insight in just understanding how our mind works. But when you think of planning, if I think of planning, you don't necessarily think of someone who's got interesting insights about how our mind works and how they might respond. You're sort of more thinking from the air, that goes there, and a bit of building here and this there. Um, so this 360 degree lens is really, I mean, all through my life, I think if you said, what have you been trying to do in your life? I would say I've been trying to widen the way we try to look at things. That doesn't mean I've got the answer, but at least let's not exclude this other forms of knowledge that are there. I mean, obviously in Australia, indigenous, indigenous knowledge and all of that, which obviously a lot of you are working on. But, you know, there's so many other things as well, which are a bit like that. Basically, we're looking at everything through a narrow lens and we're organized in a narrow way. I mean, I think some of the best meetings I have, and obviously, you know, sometimes you think, I think this and I know that, is when you've got different people coming in and you just sort of say, oh, okay. But that requires these listening qualities. And if you think of government and governance and meetings in authorities, perhaps in private sector and public sector, that's sort of just, hey, let's, can we just listen a bit? It's probably often not enough of it. I agree. So I'm going to return to Canberra now as the subject of the future project, particularly because we live here. Um, and as you know, Canberra by Walter Burley Griffin's own proclamation in 1912 was designed as an ideal city. So we hear it's a city that meets the ideal of the city of the future. So now more than a century later and very much in the future, what are your impressions of this declaration? Is Canberra an ideal city? Uh -huh. <laughs> Can I just repeat that? Is Canberra an ideal city? Whew. It's interesting. When you look at utopian ideas and ideals of cities through time, they're all slightly different. And But one thing about many of them, the early ones, many of the Italian ones, uh, they were about, the first one, the Renaissance city was called Pienza, it was an ideal city, it was about the human being, the citizen being the centre of things. In other times, it was about how do we gather together and communicate. Now, these are slightly different ideals from the Canberra ideal because I can't see within the Canberra ideal as a core thing, how do we meet, how do we gather, how do we come together? So... It's a different ideal. It might be an ideal in its own terms, but is it the ideal we want? Now, if the world is mixing up and different people from different backgrounds are coming together, surely one of our main ideals has to be how in relative harmony, without ghettoizing each other and having prejudices about each other, how do we live together in relative harmony? So my ideal has a slightly different emphasis from that ideal. I can see and feel the magisterial gestures and all of that, and I can be awed in a sense. But then when I'm just trying to be myself, mm -hmm. an authentic self, <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's sort of a different experience. So for me, in the Canberra context, there's a sort of interesting, I don't know what to call it, thing, mm -hmm. two extremes between that big gesture and this local livability. How do you blend that together? And I think that is the current challenge. It's really a challenge of software, the software of the city, the people, another way of saying it, the activities and so on, is really the issue for me now. Sorry, if I'm speaking as an outsider and a critical friend, I mean, you know. We're all critical friends here. Yeah. I actually wanted you to say no. <laughs> All right, I, I, an ideal city because there's no. Well, I said, it's an ideal city. Well, I did say I had a different. <laughs> time. You are, you, but you've said diplomatic. almost every other time. <laughs> I know, but this time you were so generous. Uh, all right, shall I say no? <laughs> Don't be so no, friendly, no. Charles. <laughs> all right, yeah. Uh, I did have a question that I was going to touch on. If Canberra can know, if Canberra 
is no longer to find identity in the legacy of an ideal city because in many ways cities and relationships have gone beyond that. I guess my question was what will or does define the city? So how can we transcend the image of the plan, which is what you spoke about, we're looking from above and that's how we're creating city. Um, Noting the importance still of history, memory, tradition, to develop distinctiveness and clarity of purpose. So where do we then find our distinctiveness if it's not through the image of the plan, which is our legacy? That's where, I mean, one of my little key sentences that took me 30 years to work out is the soft is the hard. You know, the hardware to some extent, obviously it's quite difficult, but is easier than this thing that we're talking about, which is about relationships, people coming together. I think the coming together and the conversation, the bigger conversation that that is, it's not only about conversation, it's your work and all of these other things and what you do is what then defines the identity. And the backdrop is the setting, the, the, the physical setting. So for me, there's a dramatic shift required. And obviously it's an incredibly well-educated place, Canberra. So I would have thought the identity comes from saying, okay, ideal, let's just pick up ideal. Okay, that was ideal that Burley Griffin said, but actually our ideal, this is what I'm going to say later today at some point, is to be the best city for the world, not in the world. And what am I giving back How am I going to be generous to the world? So that's all the things we talked about. Environmental things was just one one example, but there's other things. So for me, if and you can't just sort of force this onto a city, but if the city felt, if it could take the word, word ideal and redefine what that means for today, that would be fantastic because what I'm always searching for personally is always some sort of connection with someone else where I feel I'm not bonded in a deep way, but relatively bonded. Do you see what I mean? That I'm not just talking to some object there. And so I think human relations is, is, is everything. Um, and then particularly because you've got all these educated people, they can invent things. They can invent things for the world. They can turn the talk into reality. Uh, then you suddenly think of, I don't know, all these companies that could be set up, all these things that could be initiated and so on, and therefore to be a model for the world, for you to look at, sorry, others to look at you and feel this is a thinking place, a thinking place that also does. I, I know you speak a lot about, and I love the the kind of hardware software analogy. I think that's really fantastic. To me, it seems that Canberra is uh, uh, rich in software when one thinks of the intellectual capital in the city. We have two universities in the city of 400,000. We have yeah. multiple levels of governance and all of the think tanks and consultants and lobbyists that go with all of that. So it seems that there's a, a rich potential of ideas and perhaps would even position Canberra as almost an expert city. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems that the imageability of the city is is problematic, though, because as you've spoken to earlier, the the the, the, the invention of the city, of course, was for a federal or a uh-huh. national identity, and it's really struggled, I think, to find a kind of a localness. Yeah. It strikes me that Canberra perhaps could not even qualify as a city because it doesn't really have a town hall, it doesn't have a square, it doesn't have a place where people on mass gather um, yeah. so I, and i know that you speak quite a lot about sort of small a architecture the need for lots and lots of little things but uh, i was wondering if you could perhaps make a comment on um the idea of a city serving itself or, or what even you know what might define a city i guess what is there a really fundamental definition because it seems to me a problem of design here yeah i mean, I mean normally you we think, I suppose, of a city when lots of people come together somehow and are living in the same space, we might call that a human settlement. We then tend to say a human settlement of a certain size is then either a town or a city depending on, 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 on size. So, so, so that is a city. Now, this thing about this massive insertion of this contrived because it's obviously a contrived metropolis it's a fabrication um 
And that fabrication isn't really a city. It's a bit like the new capital of Myanmar or the way in Kuala Lumpur has sort of taken places in the middle of nowhere. You just see these buildings that have none of the normal texture that you associate with daily life. And therefore the layers are, are shallower, actually. And cities, to me, are places of complexity and proximity. And that complexity you haven't really got when you've got the set piece. So you're probably trying to then recreate or reinforce the complexity in other places. But there's still this tendency here to sort of always isolate things. So even you're in the civic, there's the cultural things which are over there. And there's the shopping centre which is over here where this blending, I, I feel blending is, 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 is really important. I mean, w people say like some parts of Paris and they like it because you have a shop in the ground floor, you might have an office on the next floor, and then there's living accommodation on the next. Now, these are all classic mixed uses that we've had historically, which through a certain sort of planning, we've sort of separated everything out. And... That's why it doesn't often, to me, feel like a city. It feels like a place of places. I don't know if that's the right expression, no, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, rather than this thing that you we're trying to talk about, which is the city. So the city is exchange, trade, it's all of these things. And therefore, the city needs to create these conditions for this to happen. And is that perhaps, I mean, you've spoken previously on uh, experimental zones or the idea of yeah. getting labs, do you think that that's perhaps a way that we can set the conditions for a, a city or a knitting well, perhaps of places? Well, I think the whole thing, I'm just going to write this down, is, is knitting. It's knitting. I think of cities as sort of weaving. You're weaving together elements and knitting. I'm thinking of textiles and all of these things are the metaphors I have in my mind. Now, uh, back to labs and so on, because there's a preciousness about Canberra, therefore a lab is probably a very good idea, but not just one lab in the lab zone. Mm. The danger here would be let's have the lab yeah. zone. Another place. More yeah. vitrine. <laughs> no. be, in, be interesting over there. Yeah. <laughs> but boring here. No, no, but do you see what I'm saying? Um, so I think it's, it is it is about this weaving thing. Um I often think, perhaps it's a bad analogy, that, that cities should be a bit like octopuses, you know, sort of the tentacles sort of spreading out but then sort of connecting and things like that. Um, I think our final question now, Charles, but I wanted to ask and we're going to return to that, that I guess, phrase punching above its weight, but could you leave us with any takeaway pointers for how you think Canberra can punch above its weight? I, I think... If Canberra surprises the world, it would be punching above its weight. If it could deal with this thing about the national showcase and local livability and see as its new ideal, this is the place where people connect and we represent a model. We're striving to be a model for the world. You might not in on day one punch above your weight, but in time – People might look at you, be inspired by you. Interesting people might come here and help that punching above the weight uh, uh, issue. Thank you so much, Charles. That's fine. I feel so lucky to have spoken with you. Well, I'd like to thank Charles Landry for joining us this morning for a wonderful conversation around Canberra and the future possibilities of Canberra. So thank you, Charles. Thank you. Great to be here. listening to this Uncover podcast in conversation with Charles Landry. Did you know that a University of Canberra researcher is finding the benefits of art intervention for people living with dementia? Or did you see the behind the scenes video of UC students and architecture staff building a sustainable pavilion for the Design Canberra Festival? You can find out about these incredible stories and more on Uncover, our storytelling platform at canberra.edu.au forward slash uncover. Uncover.